All right. Hi, Founder fans. Jason here. Welcome to this week's uh, Founders of the Week. I almost said Founder of the Day. Founders of the Week. Thank you for coming. As everyone rolls in here, um, I'm rolling up my sleeves. We're going to have a fantastic week. I do want to note, I don't know if Matthew was here yet, but we did have some questions last week that I left a little bit unresolved. Uh, and both of them are still fairly unresolved. So one question was uh, as far as William Parker, who had found $400,000, what type of currency it was. Uh, the only thing I could find in the letter he wrote is that it was dollars. Uh, again, probably Spanish dollars, because at the time they would have referenced continentals as continentals. Uh, or, hi Matthew, uh, they would have either rent, uh, referenced them as continentals, or they would have referenced uh, pounds or specie or things like that. So probably they were talking about Spanish dollars. As for the founder who got drunk and tipped a cow, or as the story goes, may have bumped into a cow and apologized, I was not able to search. I was searching for like 45 minutes today just to find the name of the person and see if it was uh, Luther Martin who we were discussing last week. But apparently, uh, I, I put it out there on Twitter about half an hour ago. You might have seen it because I gave up. I was like all ready to start the thing and I was looking for it. I couldn't find it. So... Hopefully we'll find out that information. I know I also heard that story as one of you had commented on, but I can't figure out who it might be. So anyway, let's get to this week's founders. And we are going to start with a gentleman named, and I'll bring up the picture here, William Hindman. Now, I'm going to be honest with you right off the bat. There are certain uh, founders that I research and research to write a fun article and have something fun to talk about here, and I kind of can't find much. And I am a little bit, I don't want to say embarrassed, but disappointed in the results of this particular article because William Hindman really didn't seem to have any fun stories to find. He kind of had one that seemed like fun, and I hinted at it in the title of the article, Weathering the Storm. Uh, William Hindman was um, a Marylander who joined the American Revolution early. He became one of Maryland's first treasurers during the Revolutionary period. And while he was a treasurer, and I will bring myself back up here, uh, while he was treasurer, it seemed that Maryland uh, had two treasurers for a time. There was a lot of experimenting going on during the early years of the American Revolution, and one of which was places like Maryland had two treasurers, one for the eastern shore and one for the west half of the uh, young state. And William Hidman was appointed as treasurer for the Eastern Department. Uh, he was there for a while before being elected to his state Senate. And then he went on to uh, join the Continental Congress for two years. Uh, he didn't do much of note in the Continental Congress, although I will say I did find his name on one of Sarah Livingston Jay's famous party invitations. Uh, I, we discussed Sarah Livingston Jay some months ago. Uh, she was the spouse of John Jay and the daughter of uh, William Livingston, longtime governor of New Jersey, uh, from a very, very important founder, and she would later go on when John Jay was the first chief justice. Uh, some of her dinners would be very instrumental in organizing, uh, you know, backroom deals, so to speak. And she kept a, kept a famous list of her dinner guests, which is a laundry list of important founders. Uh, and William Hinman was on one of those lists. Now, that's not the coolest thing I found about him, but it's basically the second coolest thing, because other than that, I found a letter from Abigail Adams where she was writing about uh, she was docked in a port in Massachusetts. Uh, the particular port escapes me. It wasn't Boston. Uh, but there was a, a terrible storm. A nor'easter came through and another ship kind of hobbled into port. And the men on her ship, went, including the doctor, went out to see if everyone was okay and see if they can help. And everyone seemed to be fine, but they did find William Hindman in, quote, almost terrified to death. So I could not figure out why he was on this boat, why he was traveling to Massachusetts at this time in 1778. So even before uh, the constitution had been ratified, uh, I can only assume he was going there on some kind of business. Um, but William Hinman does go on to become a federalist. He serves in the uh, United States House of Representatives for most of the 1790s. And then uh, once Jefferson takes over as president, the Democratic Republicans take over he essentially retires. So that is the entirety of the life of William Hinman, a very, very random founder. I I wish there was more I could tell you. Again, I put in 
more research on this than I do on most of my articles. And that's how it works out. The ones I really search and work the hardest on are the least fun to talk about. But once I dedicate myself to a founder, you know, I don't want to say, no, forget this guy. He's not worth my time. It's like, I want to at least try and, and write the article because they're all founders to me. And I want to give them all their opportunity, even if they're really boring. So we'll get right through that nice and quick through William Hindman of Maryland. Um, so we are going to move on now. To those of you who watch regularly, you know that on Fridays, I used to write about Federalist Papers, and now I write about Anti-Federalist on Anti-Federalist Fridays. And this week, we had an article titled, Rhode Island, is an, Rhode Island as an Anti-Federalist Example. Now, what I wrote about here is a paper called, Rhode Island is Right. And I saw this, and I was like, well, that looks like a really interesting article. Uh, anti-federalist paper that I've never read about before. So let's take a look at what it says. And I did that. First thing I want to note uh, about this paper is it was reprinted all over the colonies. It seems to have been a, an, um, a letter to the editor kind of thing. So I'll bring myself back up here. It was basically a letter to the editor uh, saying several things that we'll get into. And it was reprinted throughout the colonies, and I had a difficult time determining exactly where it was originally printed, although it seems to have been in late November of 1787, it was printed in a Boston paper, of which at the time, from my research, it looks like there were six. And it doesn't really specify which one, and I got a little bit lost trying to track it back, uh, and decided to focus that time and energy on actually reading the paper <laughs> and what it said. And it said some interesting things. First of all, um, it, it offers a general criticism. I'll remind you, Rhode Island did not go to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, they didn't even show up. They also would not follow the Constitution's rules where they had to have a convention. Instead, Rhode Island went on to have a referendum, which is a fancy word for vote of the people, the white landowning people, men who could vote, of course, at the time, but still, a referendum is a vote of the people, a popular vote. So Rhode Island is right, uh, was saying Rhode Island was right, not necessarily to have a referendum instead of the ratification, but not to go at all and to vote it down. It was overwhelmingly voted down by the people of Rhode Island. Uh, in, additionally, with after espousing many common criticisms that the Anti-Federalists had of the United States Constitution, uh, it did say that the states would become, quote, mere corporations, which I thought was very interesting. And then it went on to discuss why Rhode Island was exceptional compared to the other states. And of the many things, it brought up, uh, well, first of all, the Constitution is famously brought up to correct fundraising efforts that the Articles of Confederation could not live up to. But it points out that, hey, Rhode Island paid all its taxes it was asked to pay. Uh, it did not pay certain impost taxes, which they thought were unfair and illegal, but it did pay the debts it was required to to help pay off the war. Now, uh, it goes on to talk about slavery, which is uh, usually left out. There were some people, some anti-federalists, who criticized the idea that slavery was permitted in the Constitution. But this one actually points out that Rhode Island had, for all intents and purposes, already outlawed slavery by the time the Constitution was being presented. The people took it upon themselves to get rid of the horrible institution and find ways for people of all uh, skin tones to get together and live in harmony. Although, again, it's not like anyone but wealthy white-owning men voted, but at least they had eliminated slavery and were on their way to equality. That being said... The the author of Rhode Islanders Right, which again was seems to have been just an editorial, someone just wrote into their paper. Uh, they say that because slavery was a part of the Constitution, for if each if some states had slavery, then other ones to compete on an equal footing in the same nation as these other states, it would incentivize people to start purchasing slaves again, and would actually reverse the efforts of the people of Rhode Island and to be fair, several other states, to abolish slavery. And that is the main crux of Rhode Island is Right. I was very surprised when I heard this as an argument. I have not ever run into this particular argument in any other of the of the um, anti-federalist papers. Granted, it might be a little difficult to argue it, because just because 
you know, your neighbor state does something doesn't mean you have to. But again, the point is Rhode Island is such a small state that they have to compete with the larger states on any possible front. That's Rhode Island is right. Of course, if you guys have any questions along the way, feel free to ask. I'm moving through a little quick today. I'm a little surprised, but this next person should take us a little bit of time. This gentleman is William Morgan. Now, I'm going to take a sip of water right now because William Morgan is going to give us quite a treat. You see, William Morgan is the, 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 the pro projectionist, the, the main character behind America's first great conspiracy theory. That's right. William Morgan, uh, he exposed Freemason secrets. So I'm going to bring myself back up here and talk to you about William Morgan. So you may know that the American revolutionaries, many of them, were Freemasons. And you may also know that Freemasonry, in conspiracy theory circles today, is a major part of the, uh, we'll say, Illuminati. Not taking sides here. I'm not trying to offend you if you believe it. Definitely not trying to offend you if you don't believe it. Just saying that uh, people who run in conspiracy circles tend to have a sour taste for Freemasons. And I'm here to let you know the reason they have a sour taste for Freemasons is William Morgan. Now, William Morgan was born in Virginia, but he moved around a lot as a kid, and he ends up in Rochester, New York. Now, while he's in Rochester, he makes these claims, uh, hey, I'm a, I'm a veteran of the War of 1812. Now, we can't really substantiate that. There's no records that anyone's been able to find that he did fight in the War of 1812. It's not to say he didn't. Records weren't necessarily perfect back then, and things got destroyed. Uh, everything was written by hand at this point. Keep that in mind. But he also claimed he was a high-level Freemason. Now, William Morgan, for lack of a better term, was a... Uh, he's kind of a scumbag. So... The Freemasons who were living in Rochester, New York, really didn't think that this guy had become such a high level. Because like many social clubs, uh, the Freemasons, although they are secret, and I don't know for certain, the understanding is, uh, you know, you join at the bottom level and you work your way up over the years as you earn trust, like uh, uh, many organizations. Now, uh, the idea that this low moral alcoholic could be a low-level Freemason. Now, that wouldn't have been so crazy. But the idea that he was a high-ranking Freemason, the other Masons in Rochester didn't necessarily believe the, sh the stranger when he came in saying that. And so, therefore, you know, they did a little interrogating, uh, and then they essentially said, no, you can't come in. You're not part of us. You're not one of us. So, Morgan was super embarrassed by this, as you can imagine, um, and he was very angry. So what he does is he writes a tell-all book that was going to expose Freemason secrets. Ooh. So the Freemasons, uh, again, in Rochester, are not happy about this. Um, I will say, this was a time, this was during the, uh, what's the word, uh, era of good feelings under President James Monroe. And during the era of good feelings, there was a new wave of, democratic-ish feelings where many states were starting to let white men who didn't own any land vote. Ooh, it's so democratic. I know it seems foolish in hindsight, but at the time, you know, these were the beginnings of the steps towards the equality that we are, you know, enjoy today and, and, and want to enjoy in the future even more. Uh, so, it was important that we were making these steps, but because there was this new wave of the people having a say, you know, you had, you just started having Andrew Jackson running for president, who was really the first like people's president. I know there's many Native Americans who would disagree with that, um, but that was the attitude at the time as he was running as a um, populist, essentially president. Uh, so. With all this adding up, and this gentleman, William Morgan, about to publish again a, quote, tell-all book, although we don't know if he really had anything to tell, um, 
he really angered the Freemasons because he was turning sentiment against them, at least in his town. So he was going to publish this in a local newspaper uh, by a man named David Cade Miller. So all of a sudden, someone attempts to burn down David Cade Miller's print shop. That fails. They put out the fire, luckily, but then William Morgan is arrested on charges of burglary and unresolved debts. The burglary? Probably not. The unresolved debts? Probably. <laughs> so, either way, David Cade Miller comes down to the prison and bails out this guy, William Morgan. He knows that whether or not William Morgan is telling the truth, he's going to publish this book and make a whole bunch of money. <laughs> so, he gets him out of jail. And then Morgan just arrested again immediately, this time on a charge of failing to pay his bar tap. Again, probably this dude was a drunk and like couldn't really carry a job. He worked odd jobs here or there. So like the idea that he didn't pay his bar tab makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, but this time before Miller could get down there to bail Morgan out of jail, well, a bunch of men show up and take him from the jail and put him to a carriage waiting outside. And they leave Rochester. Two days later, they're spotted in at Fort Niagara, which is just outside of modern-day Buffalo, New York. It's about, a, as a person from upstate New York, I'll tell you, it's about a, an hour and a half, almost two-hour drive. Took them two days, they just show up there. And Morgan's with them. And then these people kind of get out of public view, and William Morgan is never seen again. Just to recap, the Masons in Rochester have this gentleman, William Morgan, arrested twice on trumped-up charges because he's going to publish a tell-all book about their organization, and after the second time he's arrested, Morgan is disappeared. This doesn't necessarily help out the Freemasons in the fashion they might have suspected it. Now, uh, first of all, I do have to note, um, we don't know what happened to Morgan. He may have been murdered and thrown in the river, or he may have been given a very large sum of money to cross the border to Canada and never return. It's up in the air. We'll never know. Although I will say... Uh, he doesn't seem like the type, Morgan doesn't seem like the type of gentleman who would take that money and just go and disappear and keep his mouth shut. He seems like the type of gentleman who would take that money, go spend it on booze, and then open his mouth back up. So, if that indicates which way I lean on the conspiracy, that's your decision. <laughs> Balls in your court. Um, also... I do want to note that uh, uh, Cade, uh, what was it? David Cade Miller, he ends up printing the book, uh, Free uh, I believe it's titled uh, uh, Freemason Secrets or something of that nature. He prints this book as a book instead of in his newspaper, and it becomes a wild success. Wild success. Uh, to the point where, again, this is during the James Monroe administration, and... John Adams and, and Andrew Jackson are already competing for the next presidency. So it's close to the end of the American founding. I do want to note, like, this is, I am arguably a little bit after the founding. But again, era of good feeling in my book, still there. Anyway, uh, while these people were running for president, John Quincy Adams essentially becomes anti-Masonic. It seems that he read this book. It became, again, a wild, successful book. Uh, conspiracy theory, all the rage. It seemed that uh, Quincy Adams read it. And then years later, eventually there was an anti-Masonic party. It was a real political party in the United States that ran Millard Fillmore, I believe it was. Let me just double check that it was Millard Fillmore. Yes, John Quincy Adams considered himself anti-Masonic, as did Millard Fillmore, who was actually nominated by the Anti-Masonic Party to run for president, um, but he was also nominated by a real another party. I don't want to say, I don't want to imply that the Anti-Masonic Party was not a real party. It was a real party in the United States, and it nominated a president. 
Um, something though. Um, either way, that is the story of William Morgan. So leave me a comment. Let me know if you think, uh, what do you think? You think he was murdered or do you think he was paid off? Or do you think something else? Let me know in the comments. That'd be great. Um, while you're down there, hit like. I really appreciate that. Uh, I am going to take another sip of water and we are going to move on to Richard Peters. I'm going to show you his picture. Looks like a nice guy. I think he looks like a nice guy. Richard Peters from Secretary to the Board of War. So, Richard Peters was a... Um, he was in Philadelphia. Uh, by the time the revolution broke out, he was already the Admiralty Register. That is a title. Um, the owl, my hair looks sticking up. Anyway, <laughs> he is the Admiralty Register of Philadelphia, which essentially means he was in charge of keeping track of all the boats that came into and then left Philadelphia. And when the uh, revolutionary government took over Philly, Richard Peters became a rebel. He was radicalized because at, he was a mer also a merchant in the city and he obviously didn't like the taxes that were hurting merchants. And he became, uh, he continued in his position overseeing the boats coming into and out of the city until in, uh, I believe it was 1778, might've been nine, might've been 79. Um, the board of war, uh, continental Congress had created the board of war to oversee the war and basically be George Washington's boss. But what they did is they reorganized it at one point and they got rid of all, they took anyone who was in the continental Congress off the board and made and put on private citizens so that the war was actually being run theoretically by private citizens. Of course, George Washington was in charge. Uh, and when he sent word back, the board didn't really tell him what to do. They would offer advice. Uh, and even when they, you know, when they told him what to do, it was like, maybe you do this. <laughs> uh, but I bring this up because Richard Peters was appointed to the board of war. He was hired, I should say, as secretary for the Board of War. So he was actually hired as its go-to person to do the hard work for the board, uh, write the letters, make sure everything got delivered, all that jazz. A really important person, essentially the administration of the war's administration, if that makes any sense. I know I'm twisting words around. Uh, so he does this and then he goes, uh, he ends up, I'm sorry, Oh, of course, after his time as serving as secretary to the Board of War, he himself is elected to the Continental Congress, and he serves there for almost a decade, on and off, for the, for about 13 years, uh, which his time running Philadelphia's port helped him serve well at. So after the American Revolution ends, this gentleman, Richard Peters, uh, he ends up being one of many people who realize there's a certain conflict that happens. You see, while the Americans were part of Great Britain, the main church that most Americans prayed at was the Church of England, because they were English. Now again, there of course were many reasons people went to different parts of different colonies, I should say. You know, for example, Maryland was filled with Catholics. It was a safe place for Catholics to move at a time where there wasn't necessarily a lot of safe places for them to live in England. Uh, as we discussed last week, you know, there were hotbeds of Judaism, uh, various sects of Christianity had, play, you know, Quakers, I, of course, in Philadelphia, blah, blah, blah. But the majority of colonists and then after the revolution, Americans were celebrated the Church of England. Unfortunately, when you throw off England, there's a little bit of tension there if you want to pray at its church. And Richard Peters was one of the people, and there were a handful of different people who went representing different states uh, at a time before the Constitution. So, you know, the step separate states had to handle these kinds of things themselves. He went to meet on behalf of Pen uh, Pennsylvania and I believe it was Maryland and parts of Virginia. He was sent as an envoy for several states, primarily in the mid-Atlantic. So Peters goes and he meets in England and is able to mend some fences, actually, and get concessions permitting uh, Americans to have, uh, getting recognition for American denominations of the Church of England. So they, <laughs> as crazy as it sounds, it was theoretically because they didn't, no one wanted to create a Church of the United States. 
not that I've seen. I'm sure there were outliers who people who thought that was a good idea, but for the most part, n no one really thought that was a good idea yet. I will say, uh, just after the American founding, there is kind of an outbreak of new religions. Um, the Oneidas, uh, the Mormons, for example, uh, in the you know 1830s, 1840s. Uh, but again, that's a little out of our purview. So that did happen, um, but just not quite yet. And Richard Peter's big thing is he did get uh, certain concessions um, to uh, permit Americans to celebrate as members of the Church of England, despite not being England. Because at, at the time, as with today, uh, some things are considered to transcend governments. And that was the argument he brought to England and most of the religious leaders in the Church of England agreed. Uh, he would, uh, Richard Peters would later go on to be in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, and he was nominated as the federal judge for the District of Pennsylvania by George Washington, and he held on to that for several years. Uh, eventually, um, yeah, even tried cases... I'm sorry. I got a little bit distracted by something that's not Richard Peters. I apologize. I'm live and I'm 20 minutes in. It's too early to get distracted. So anyway, that's the essence of Richard Peters. He did some things. Like I said, ran the port of England, ran the port of England, ran the port of Philadelphia, uh, served on the board of war, served in the Continental Congress and helped bring the Church of England back to the United States in so many words. So um, I'm going to take a quick sip of water. I'm drinking a lot of water today. It's a little hot got to turn off my heat. Anyway, we are going to go on to someone whose picture I don't really have. I didn't want to steal one because it's on certain books, but um, it's about Ona Judge, who's also uh, often called Oni. I, I believe uh, she was called Oni by many people at the time who knew her personally, but her real name seems to have been Ona. Um, and I titled... The after what it says here, absconded from the household of the president, Ona Judge's escape. Ona Judge has actually become fairly popular over the last handful of years uh, because she not only fled from she not only fled slavery to freedom, she fled from the household of George Washington himself. So a little backstory: uh, Ona was born in uh, on. Ona came from a family that belonged to Martha Washington's ex-husband. And when Martha Washington's first husband passed away, she had what was called dower slaves. So these slaves were his, and they were the property of his son, a.k.a. Martha Washington's son, uh, John Custis, John Park Custis. But that son was a little boy. So Martha Washington uh, held on to these slaves. And they lived in Washington's household, but were not technically George's. Either way, as the master of the house, they were, of course, under his guard. Now, as for Ona, uh, she had a white father, and I am not sure uh, the background of her mother 100%, but she uh, Ona may have been up to 75% white. Now, I only bring this up because uh, the, the pigment of a person's skin at the time meant a lot. It, uh, slaves who had lighter skin, even if they were black, they still, they were generally worked in the house. Um, and again, as always, I do not agree with any of this. Just want to make that clear. Uh, this is just how it happened. Um, that being said, Ona Judge became Martha Washington's personal servant. And as such, she was a very visible character, especially by the time that George Washington became president and moved to Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia is interesting because in 1780, Pennsylvania outlawed slavery, but they used, they did use gradual emancipation and they had certain rules for people who were not residents of Philadelphia, AKA the president of the United States, who argued that he was only there in Philadelphia as the seat of the federal government or else he had no business being in Philadelphia, which was true. That being said, Philadelphia said that diplomats of this nature could enter, uh, Pennsylvania said diplomats of this nature could enter Philadelphia for six months without having their slaves taken by the state and set free. Uh, 
actually Edmund Pendleton, the attorney general, found this out the hard way and had several of his state's slaves freed. Uh, and Pendleton did warn Washington of this. Now, Washington would do things like bring them out, uh, bring their, bring his slaves out of Philadelphia just before the six month mark. And is, in fact, himself would leave, never stay in Philadelphia for a full six months because he himself did not want to establish permanent residency in Philadelphia. There were laws set to prevent people from doing this, but because it was George Washington, they were kind of looking the other way because if they didn't, the capital would get moved again. And Philly wanted the capital in Philly, at least for that first 10 years. That being said, because slaves were being gradually emancipated in Pennsylvania, well, own a judge, she made friends with some free black people in Pennsylvania. And while she was doing this, she, I will say, I, I, not to make it seem like her life was good, we will get to this, but as the personal body servant of Martha Washington, uh, Ona Judge had to wear the fanciest clothing, and she was ate fancier meals and better meals than most people of all backgrounds in the United States. Uh, uh, Tina, I'll get to your question in just one second. Now, um, Ona, unfortunately, didn't like being a slave. I don't know why I said unfortunately. Imagine that. She didn't care for being a slave, especially when she saw all these free people in Philadelphia. Oh, I did want to mention that she was given money by Washington on several occasions to do things like go to, uh, not just to market, but to the circus and to see shows in town. Uh, she was trusted by the family. Uh, and, and in a way, they, they did love her. Again, uh, she was a slave, so there, she like couldn't reciprocate. Like they couldn't, couldn't really be loved like a family. Uh, generally, uh, masters did look at their slaves uh, as the same way they looked at women, which was as children who needed to be taken care of. Again, I will reiterate, this is not good. This is not how I look at things. Uh, but this is how it was seen at the time. However, while the family was preparing to return to Virginia and packing their bags, Ona Judge made her escape. One day, she just kind of, as they put it, absconded from the household of the president. She was helped by several uh, members of the black community in Philadelphia who she had made friends with. They got her on a ship, which I believe was called the Reprisal. I have it here somewhere. Uh, the Nancy, sorry. She got on a ship called the Nancy uh, and the ship captain fled and took her to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And if you've watched this channel for any amount of time, you've known I like talking about Portsmouth, New Hampshire because they ended up having a very important um, uh, little <laughs> bastion of freedom for black people in the young United States. And we're actually going to talk about that with uh, Founder later. So I will save that for now. But Ona went to... Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and the Washingtons wanted to get her back. They put advertisements, runaway slave advertisements in the paper. Um, George contacted Oliver Wolcott Jr., who I am planning on making a video about very soon. People have asked me about that uh, in the comments of my Oliver Wolcott Sr. videos um, recently. Uh, Oliver Wolcott Jr. was the second treasurer of the United States, and he contacted a man named Joseph Whipple, who is one of the founders this week. So again, I'm not going to talk too much about him. Try to get Joseph Whipple to get Ona, Judge. Uh, Joseph talked to Ona uh, and said, you sh I should arrest you and send you back to George. And she told him that all she wanted was freedom. She understood that she would not have the fancy clothing and good food that she had with Washington. She just wanted to be free. And... Uh, Joseph Whipple was totally okay with that, as we will get to later, and didn't arrest her. Uh, and actually, she was sold out by a daughter of um, John Langdon, who was another very important founder. John Langdon uh, did... Uh, it was one of his daughters who was friends with Martha Washington's granddaughter. I forgot. There is one thing I left out of this story. The reason that the impetus for Ona to judge to run away was not just her desire for freedom, but the fact that she was told she was going to be given as a wedding gift to one of Martha Washington's granddaughters, whose name escapes me, but she was kind of hot-tempered and seems like kind of a turd. And Ona Judge, 
again, working directly in Washington's household, of course there were violence against slaves when they, you know, stepped out of line. Not my idea, their idea. There was violence uh, and it was uh, terrible. But as long as you were on, again, not my idea, but your best behavior, things could be very well if you were one of the fortunate fortunate slaves who lived in a household who worked directly uh, and I'll say it had lighter skin if your dad was white it made your life generally speaking better but if you're put in the household with a hot-tempered lady then things could just seriously be bad all the time and that's what Ona saw coming and that's the impetus for her to actually leave and go seek her freedom she ends up in New Hampshire one of this granddaughter's friends was a daughter of John Langdon who sold her out to Joseph Whipple who talked to her and said no that's okay and then another man was sent again whose name escapes me to capture Ona she saw him coming and hid and this man went and stayed with the Langdon family overnight and he said I'm gonna go abduct her tomorrow and John Langdon and the Langdon family this time, now that John was involved, uh, got word to her to go slip away and helped her evade capture the second time. So Ona actually then lives in Portsmouth for 50 more years, lives almost till the Civil War, a nice long life. And we know so much about her because in the, seven, in the 1840s, well after the American founding, she's an old woman and she gives several interviews. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> she gives several interviews uh, about her life as a slave for the George Washington. You can understand why people would be interested in that kind of thing then as now, as you are. <laughs> so uh, she ends up marrying. She has three kids. She apparently survives them all. She had two daughters who, uh, and one son. Her son ends up being a, a seaman and uh, we don't know what happens to him. Don't know if he gets lost at sea or, or just disappears or whatever. Um, but Ona ends up living an extraordinarily poor life. Uh, very broke. She ends up getting some help from neighbors by the time she's an older woman. And in these older interviews, she's asked uh, what if she regrets having left. Like, the, it sounds terrible to say, but uh, living with the Washingtons was one of the most luxurious lifestyles a black person could have at the time other than the whole being a slave which is what makes what ona said so interesting when asked if she regrets leaving the washington household she 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 said no i am free and i consider ona judge an american founder for several reasons first of all she was right there for the founding she was in philly <laughs> well you know she would have been literally in the room as George Washington was having important dinners uh, with other people. Uh, granted, Martha Washington would have been asked to leave while the men spoke on several occasions. It's really hard for me to talk about this particular uh, founder without sounding terrible. Uh, but unfortunately, this is how things worked back then. That being said, Ona Judge went on to... Um, she embodies the freedom that many of the American founders were fighting for. And I know we still have not necessarily gotten that equality that everyone's looking for, the equality of opportunity they were talking about back then. But she heard the words of freedom. She saw the situation she was in and she went uh, and achieved it and lived a long life. So thumbs up to own a judge. Uh, again, there's several books written about her. There's one that came out a few years back called Never Caught. Um, and then there's actually Never Caught has been given a, a young adult version also. So if you if you know anyone who's younger and is interested in getting into the um, Revolutionary War or learning about history or anything like that, uh, uh, I would I've only read the grown up grown up version of Never Caught, um, but you might want to uh, point them at the the younger version. That being said, this week's book of the week, and I do see some questions coming in. I'm going to get that is American Slavery, American Freedom. This is a book I read in college. It was assigned to me and it's by Edmund S. Morgan, who is one of the, um, one of the leading American revolution students of the late 20th century. I should know if he's still alive. I'm not hundred percent sure. I think he's still alive. 
excuse me, but American Slavery, American Freedom discusses um, colonial Virginia and even at the end gets through the revolution and talks about not only how slavery came to Virginia and how it developed over 150 years up until the revolution, but really talks about how the freedom that the American founders were fought for, especially in Virginia, was only possible because of slaves in many ways. Uh, that's a brief summation of an entire book. I, I really do recommend this book. It's anything by Edmund S. Morgan. I don't, I'm sure there's one behind me. If there's not, then downstairs on my bigger stack of books. Uh, I have plenty of Edmund S. Morgan. I highly recommend. Um, as far as like intellectual American Revolution books go, he is a little bit more palatable than someone like Gordon Wood or something, someone of that nature. Um, so it's a little bit above casual American Revolution read, uh, but a little bit below, I can't understand any of the words in this book, which we've all been there. Uh, I do see some questions coming in. Um, Tina, is it true he created the cabinet? Do you mean George Washington? Are you asking if it's true George Washington created the cabinet? Because uh, if so, yeah, it's not in the Constitution. Cabinet was just something... Uh, I don't want to say he made up. There was a cabinet of ministers in England, and a lot of America is based off English common law. Uh, so yes, Washington made it up, but no, it's not like he just invented it off the top of his head. He just liked it, so he used it. Matt, all ships seem to be the Nancy. I disagree. I think all ships are called the reprisal. <laughs> but I have run into several Nancys. You're not wrong. Uh, you're not wrong. Uh, and Zizbiz, New Hampshire is beautiful. New Hampshire is beautiful. I have been there. I went to Portsmouth a few years back specifically because I love the American Revolution, and it was, I think, I think it was right after I started Founder of the Day. Or maybe it was the following year. Man, time just blends together. But uh, if you ever want to see a city that feels like it's still in the American Revolution, I mean, go to Williamsburg, obviously. But uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, they've done a lot of great things there. Even like the parking garages they built, they still built them with the same style brick that it fits in with the uh, old timey American Revolution buildings that are there. I mean, you know, you go to, and we are going to talk about the Whipples in Portsmouth a little bit more today. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there's still the Liberty tree that William Whipple and Prince Whipple planted after signing the declaration of independence is there. Um, and, and as is his house and it's got a really old timey feel. And there's a thing called strawberry bank where, uh, in the in the 1950s, a lot of cities were kind of getting run down, and most cities in the United States went through like urban renewal, where they tore down a bunch of places and built up like projects or highways or this or that. And Portsmouth had a bunch of private investors, private citizens, I'm sorry, pool their money and invest in their own city. So they bought a big area called Strawberry Bank, which is like their Jamestown. It's it's like where the original part of the city was first built, and they froze it in history. And this is the 1950s. So there are buildings there that are from like the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, all the way up to World War II. And while I'm not sure what they're doing right now with the current plague, they did have, uh, their, they, they had like a store open where you go in and it's selling like cans of stuff from World War II. And it's like a big section of the city. And essentially... When you walk into a house, if they have the uh, the flag out front, it signals, hey, come on, walk into our house because we've preserved it. And, you know, if they go to bed, they take down the flag or something like that. It's a really fascinating thing. And and on top of that, they have a John Paul Jones house. Um, they have, uh, uh, I want to say the John Langdon house, but that, I don't think that's what it's called. Uh, my memory is filming. And then not far away, I mean, what, 20 minutes away is Exeter? where they have the Museum of the American Revolution, where there's one of the, the Purple Hearts, George, one of the few Purple Hearts. They asked me not to take a picture of it, so I'm saying it quietly. They have one of the Purple Hearts George Washington gave out um, and a bunch of other cool stuff there. Uh, yeah, New Hampshire's really cool for the American Revolution. I actually didn't even make it to uh, uh, the Bartlett House, the Josea Bartlett House, although I don't know if that's open to the public now. It wasn't then. It might have been reopened, but... I've gotten off on a strong tangent. Yes, I've been to New Hampshire. It is beautiful. Uh, I did not go to New Hampshire. Spring. I went to Vermont in the fall, and that was beautiful. So I assume 
that it is uh, much like Vermont, uh, just under upstate New York as far as beautiful. <laughs> That's my bias. I'm going to say it. I live in a place where we get literally two and a half weeks of leaves changing between real hot summer, real cold winter. And we're in the middle of it. So I got a real uh, soft spot for it now. Anyway, now that that tangent's over, we are going to pop over and talk about Silas Wheeler. Side note, uh, as I've mentioned before, Silas is a name I read in books for several decades before someone told me it was pronounced Silas. So when I accidentally say Silas, it's because how I read it for a very long time. Now, there's no real picture of him. I just took whatever American Revolution picture that seemed to fit. So not much to show you. Silas Wheeler was an American revolutionary. What do you know? He was actually from Concord. He grew up in Concord and then moved to Rhode Island when he got married. His wife was from Rhode Island. He was lived there for about a year with his in-laws when the Battle of Lexington and Concord happened. And as someone who grew up there, he had several family members, some of whom were also named Silas Wheeler, who fought in Lexington and Concord. Um, I, sh I should note that before this, Wheeler had already established himself as a patriot because he was apparently involved with the Gatsby affair. I'm not going to get too into it now, but there was a ship called the Gatsby uh, off the coast of Rhode Island that was uh, burned by patriots. And it was one of the major lead ups to the revolution. It's not as famous as the Boston Tea Party or the Boston Massacre, but it was kind of a combination of both and happened right in the middle. <laughs> they burned the ship instead of throwing tea uh, and... Yeah, it was almost kind of like a battle. Again, I'm not going to get too into it now, but, you know, maybe I'll write an article about it this week because I don't think I ever have, and I'll talk, uh, give it some time next week. But he, so he was already part of the Gatsby affair. Uh, he went off to join the fight after the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and what did he do? Well, he joined everyone's favorite hero. Say it with me. Benedict Arnold. Yes, he was a hero. Deal with it. You have to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> and before 1780, Benedict Arnold was a hero, and one of the heroic things he did early in the in the re revolution was he led a group of men, including hero Aaron Burr and a uh, future Secretary of War uh, Henry Dearborn, and today's hero uh, uh, Wheeler, Sai uh, Silas Wheeler, uh, went with about 1,200 men through the Maine wilderness. As I've discussed before, uh, this trek through the Maine wilderness went from essentially Boston up to Quebec to meet with uh, Richard Montgomery, who was leading Philip Schuyler's army, although Philip Schuyler got sick and returned. Uh, but Richard Montgomery, who had been risen from Br brigadier general to major general, Benedict Arnold was going to meet him at Quebec to win Quebec victoriously. They trekked through the woods people were starving because it was so much longer than what they were told. They were given a map and told, you'll make it in this many days, and it was way longer. They were literally forced to eat dogs, which I did read that Silas is credited as, Silas Wheeler, today's hero, is credited as saying, nothing ever tasted better to him than one of Henry Dearborn's dogs. When you haven't eaten in five days, allegedly five days, I can understand why dog would taste so good. Better than your boots. So eventually they do make it. They get to Quebec. Richard Montgomery is shot in the head and martyred immediately, followed almost immediately by Benedict Arnold, who is taken from the field. Uh, things get into disarray. The Americans evacuate. Again, Arnold's men, of which, is, uh, of which Wheeler is one, is they barely survive. Wheeler is actually taken prisoner the first of two times during this war. He's taken prisoner for about a year, during which time he can track smallpox and his hair falls out and he's bald for the rest of his life because of the smallpox that he got while in a British prison. Now, he was eventually paroled. He traveled south. He joins back up with the uh, Rhode Island militia who permits their soldiers to join, to, to jump on a ship. Uh, who I would presume is the Nancy, Matthew. Uh, no, I don't actually know the name of his ship. Uh, but he, he jumps on a ship and becomes a privateer, which, as you may know, is essentially a pirate, but is given the 
a letter of mark from a government saying, you can be a pirate, we say it's cool, and that's what he did. And then his ship was promptly captured by the British Navy, and this time he was taken as a prisoner to another continent and held in Ireland as a prisoner. So he's been a prisoner in Canada and Ireland. Now, there's a gentleman I don't know a lot about, but he seems to be a Minister of Parliament, an MP over in Britain, uh, or he would be after the unification of Britain and Ireland, a man named Henry Groton, or Grattan, I think he's Groton. So Henry Groton seems like a good enough guy because he helps Silas and uh, several other prisoners escape from captivity in Ireland and make their way to France. He gets them board on a ship to France and gives them money to pay for them to sail back to the United States. By the time Wheeler gets back to the United States, the war is essentially over, which I am sure certain he was happy about because he's lost literally all his hair and spent almost three entire years in prisons. And be, oh, I forgot to mention, because of his involvement in the Gatsby affair, he was treated extraordinarily poorly both times and somehow survives. But he makes his way back to the United States. And he's one of the few men, after the war is over and the Continental Congress can't seem to pay anyone this money that they owe, they give out land as an exchange. Now, while that might sound nice to you, most people didn't want to move far away from their families into the wilderness, and they sold the rights to this property for pennies on a dollar to speculators who made lots of money, and then many of those very wealthy speculators, important founders they were, lost all their money when the market crashed because no one wanted to go buy this land. But I digress a little bit. Mr. Wheeler was one of the founders who did want the land, and he moved to a place called Wheeler, New York. It's just south of the Finger Lakes, uh, and it's named after himself. And he actually uh, planted a bunch of trees and a bunch of tobacco. Believe it or not, people used to plant tobacco in upstate New York. My property used to be tobacco land. I know it sounds crazy. Either way, enough about me. I am going to talk a little bit more about me. He goes to... Um, he found Wheeler, New York, and he always has food on the table. So when a weary traveler comes through, he's always willing to give everyone food because he remembers the ordeal of almost starving during the trek through Maine eating dogs. Uh, and I do want to note that I'm writing this article and I keep hearing Wheeler, Wheeler. Now, I'm a hockey fan, and there's a gentleman named Blake Wheeler on the Winnipeg Jets. And that occurred to me as I'm writing the article. Earlier in the day, I'm doing the research, and I look up, okay, in New York? We're in upstate New York. And I look it up, okay, cool. And then I think, oh, I wonder if he's related to Blake Wheeler. And then I remembered, I said that to myself, like, five years ago, going to one of my spouse's friend's weddings, and I realized, oh, I remember driving through Wheeler. I remember doing 55, and then you cut down to 40 for literally 20 feet. And then there's another sign that gets you back up to 55. Now, I don't know how I remember that particular road sign, but I very clearly do. So, the town Wheeler founded named after himself cuts from 55 to 40 for literally about 20 feet. And that might be the most fascinating fact I know about him. And again, this is a guy who almost starved to death, was put in prison, lost his hair, put, shipped across the ocean, put back in prison for the United States. So that's... Silas Wheeler, when I start looking into super random names like Silas Wheeler, uh, I expect to find very little and it is trouble to make a story. This one was very easy. I was pleasantly surprised. And that's actually why Silas jumped ahead of our next founder, who this might be a little bright and hard to see, but this gentleman whose name is Joseph Whipple. Now, I want to say about the Whipple family... This is the fourth time I've used the last name Whipple in an article. Uh, one of the original people I wrote about, founders that fascinated me, and actually one of the reasons I went to visit Portsmouth, as I named before, was this gentleman, Joseph Whipple's brother, William Whipple. I wrote that article so long ago that I didn't even have a title. The title of the article was William Whipple. Not creative. But that's what happens when you print it on literally day one, two and a half years ago, when I started Founder of the Day. That being said, because I wrote it so early, it's it's kind of crappy. I'll be honest with you. Those first, you know, month or two, I, I, you know, I was feeling it out. Either way, I wrote about William, and then I wrote about his slave, Prince Whipple. And then I wrote about Prince's wife, Dinah Whipple. Now, this gentleman 
is Joseph Whipple. And in this article, I also discuss his slave, which I believe is pronounced Cuffy Whipple. C-U-F-F-E-E. -E, like coffee, but with you. I believe it's pronounced Cuffy. Okay. So I do want to recap William's life real quick. So William Whipple was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and a general in the, the uh, New Hampshire militia who led troops at the Battle of Saratoga. By his side was the only slave he ever owned, Prince Whipple. Prince would join William on his travels to Philadelphia, and though he might not have been in the room when they signed the Declaration, he might have been, he was certainly in the back rooms of the city tavern and, and the inns where they stayed while conversations about liberty and freedom were being had by the founding fathers at the time. And he overheard this. I should note that Prince worked, um, Prince uh, worked for and with William Whipple. As in, William Whipple had a mercantile house and the only employee, employee was his slave, Prince, who worked in his house, lived in his house. They saw each other every day. When they returned from the revolution, after signing the Declaration of Independence, Prince helped William plant a liberty tree, liberty tree, which I referenced before, which still stands today. And now it sounds terrible to have your slave plant your liberty tree. William saw the irony in this. So William Whipple did, first, after the war was over, he did grant Prince the rights of a free man. Now, Prince was still William's slave at this point, but he could go about his day as if he wasn't. And this was actually safer for freed slaves at the time, because if you were a freed slave and someone kidnapped you and brought you south, no one's coming to save you. But if you were someone's slave with the rights of a free man, then you can live as if you weren't a slave. But if you got kidnapped, those kidnappers weren't going to kidnap you because now you got a signer of the Declaration of Independence chasing you down <laughs> with that kind of authority. That being said, uh, William, uh, of course, having given him the rights of a free man, allowed Prince to marry uh, Dinah Whipple <laughs> and then did, actually, before he freed him, allowed Prince to join a group of 20 other slaves who wrote to the state of New Hampshire saying... Uh, we believe that we are humans and should have the same equality of opportunity as provided to all the other white dudes, not women. <laughs> even, even the black slave men were a little bit sexist at the time, uh, as ironic as that feels. Uh, and Prince, uh, these 20 men did write to the state of New Hampshire saying, we want to be free also. Now, this was kind of cast aside by the leaders of New Hampshire and never really taken up. In fact, New Hampshire never really freed their slaves. It just everyone seems kind of stopped having slaves in New Hampshire pretty quickly after the revolution. It's very peculiar. But again, as I've been mentioning, Portsmouth, uh, which I believe was the capital of New Hampshire at the time. I think it's Manchester now. Let me know. What's the capital? Man is it Manchester? Let me know. Um, but Portsmouth was by far is and was the biggest city. I think. I didn't go to Manchester. It was the biggest city at the time. It was a major port. And uh, although they ca the government cast it aside, maybe it was Exeter. Either way, doesn't matter. Uh, they still, William permitted Prince to write this. And the thing is, we don't know who wrote this request for slaves to be free to match in New Hampshire. But it sure seems like it was Prince because he knew how to read and write for a very long time at this point. And he was in Philadelphia listening to the same words of liberty that were written into this document requesting independence. A few years later, uh, William did officially grant Prince his entire freedom uh, and uh, gave him a little bit of property to build a house where he mar uh, lived with his wife, Dinah. Now, Dinah ends up outliving most of these people, and she became very important to establishing uh, a, a, um, 
the uh, education for the black community in Portsmouth. I am going to bring it up now. I forget the exact name of the institution she created, uh, the school, um, I, the Ladies Charitable African Society was a school that was free attend, free to attend for black people in Portsmouth. And it, she helped not only create it and teach at it, but she helped raise money for it and got the literacy rate of black people up to where white people essentially were because white people could read. Don't let people, people, we often fall for this like back then no one could read except rich people. No, like all white people can read. It was like a 99% literacy rate in most states because you needed to read the Bible if you wanted to go to heaven. So women knew how to read and they taught children to read as part of their schooling growing up at almost a level. 99 is probably high. Let's say 95% because there were people living in the backwards that no one kept track of. <laughs> there were some weird weirdos out there then as now. Um, but yeah, so uh, this is the situation. And Dinah was also freed uh, even before Prince was. So this is the situation where Joseph Whipple comes in. And Joseph Whipple is brothers of William, who I discussed before. So even though I've written about this is three other people named Whipple. One was William. One was his slave who took on the name of his master and kept it after liberation because they were very close and remained close. And even after he was freed and left and built his own house, Prince continued to work for the rest of his life at William's Mercantile House uh, because there was a bond between these humans, you know? Uh, and then the other one is Dinah, whose married name was Whipple when she married Prince. Uh, this is Joseph Whipple. Joseph Whipple, and we've already hit an hour, so I'll get through him as quick as I can. This is the last founder today. Joseph was William's brother. And while William was off revolutioning, William stayed home and revolutioned. He looked after his businesses and that of his brother, which I know sounds selfish, but, you know, his brother was signing the Declaration of Independence. Someone had to make sure his business didn't fall apart. Um, and his brother, Joseph, did that. Uh, Joseph does, he was technically a member of the state militia, but I couldn't find any indications of him actually serving in the war. That being said, by 1784, he was commissioned as a uh, colonel, and he was known as Colonel Whipple for, good, for the rest of his life. But he, uh, in the late 1780s, first of all, Joseph, most of what I found about Joseph Whipple was about land. He bought most of the land in Northern Maine. He owned most of Northern Maine. <laughs> Uh, and he ends up uh, being a merchant like his brother, has various business incomes, but he also ends up being customs collector at the Port of Maine. I'm sorry, Port of Portsmouth. Man, that's so hard to say. Uh, was I saying Maine before? He owned most of northern New Hampshire. Anyway, uh, Joseph becomes the customs collector at the Port of Portsmouth, which is more difficult to say than it seems. Port of Portsmouth, customs collector for a few three years until George Washington becomes president. And then George Washington hires him to become customs collector of the Port of Portsmouth for the federal government. And he stays on. He does that. And then it's about a year later in 1790, where much like his brother Joseph had owned one slave, Prince Whipple, Joseph Whipple, from my research, only owned one slave, Cuffy. Cuffy, who took his master's last name, Whipple, uh, and Cuffy Whipple was in 1790 granted his freedom, just like a few years earlier, uh, Joseph's brother William had done for Prince. He grants Cuffy his freedom. Cuffy works again for six more years for Joseph, who then gives him 50 acres of land and, that he can live and farm on. And uh, as opposed to Prince, who decided to stay with William, Cuffy decides to go and live on this land and starts a farm. And he has a family in for all intents and purposes, has a pretty gigantic family. And it was about this time in 1796 when a, a young lady named Ona Judge shows up. And since Joseph Whipple, and this is what I was talking about before that I alluded to, Joseph Whipple was working for uh, the United States Treasury Department. So President Washington loses a slave that runs away, contacts the head of the Treasury Department, who was Oliver Wolcott Jr., who replaced Alexander Hamilton. And Wolcott contacts Joseph Whipple and says, hey, can you get the president's slave back? And he goes and he talks to Ona Judge. And Ona Judge just says, I only ran away because I want my freedom. And Joseph Whipple, who I think I've proven, comes from a family who, although they all did have one slave and for all indications treated the, the one slave that each brother had 
very, very well as far as you can treat a slave goes. Um, this family had had their minds changed. They had liberated their slaves. They had let their, they had permitted their slaves to petition to outlaw slavery, which is insane to think about. <laughs> like, but the, this is how far the ideals of the revolution had come, at least to the Whipple family, and at large from what I've done, and the reason I really love Portsmouth, New Hampshire, the ideals of the revolution really blossomed in Portsmouth. So, they at the port of Portsmouth, uh, Joseph Whipple refused to arrest this woman. And he wrote to George Washington and said, I'm sorry that she, uh, paraphrasing here, but he said, at the risk of losing his job. Sorry, President Washington. This young woman told me that she only ran away from you because she didn't want to be a slave anymore. And what's really interesting is Washington didn't fire him. First of all, the Washingtons tried to get her back a little bit and then kind of seemed to keep it a little bit quiet because you don't really want to attract attention to yourself while states are outlawing slavery. And Washington himself at this point had essentially come to the conclusion that slavery was wrong. I mean, this is two years before he dies and in his will frees them upon the death of his wife. Um, although, to be fair, Ona Judge would not have been freed in Washington's will because she was not Washington's slave. She was Martha Washington's former husband's slave. I know it's interesting. Either way, uh, Joseph Ripple, at risk of losing his job, though he would have been fine owning, you know, half of New Hampshire's land and a wealthy mercantile business, that's not the point. So that's the story of Joseph Whipple. That's enough of me gushing over <laughs> um, uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and that's enough uh, of this video because I'm well over an hour now. It's almost 9.30. I'm sorry to keep you guys up so late, uh, at least on the East Coast, 9.30. Uh, Matthew, I see you say something. This is grandson some toilet paper. Is there a Whipple toilet paper that I'm not familiar with? Is that what that reference is? I'm going to assume it was. If you guys have any questions, throw them in there right now. If not, you can always contact me uh, via email, contact the founder of the day .com. Founder of the Day on Twitter, Founder of the Day on Facebook, Founder of the Day on YouTube. I'm everywhere. Most wares, not everywhere, most wares. Uh, but I really appreciate you guys joining me this whole time. Uh, I hope you had as good a time as I did. I am out of breath. I hope you enjoyed learning very specifically about Portsmouth. Again, I have this book down there. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about slavery, my lights make it hard to read. American Slavery, American Freedom. Uh, it's a um, must read to understand the evolution of slavery in colonial Virginia and in uh, leading up to Virginia at the beginning of the revolution. Uh, Matt, Mr. Whipple was the please don't squeeze the Charmin character. That was his name. I'm not. I know what you're talking about. I remember it a little bit, but I did not know Mr. Whipple was the gentleman's name. I'm assuming he's definitely related. If there's one thing I know about the don't squeeze the Charmin guy hated slavery. That's a fact. All right, guys, I'm gonna get out of here today. Uh, thank you so much for coming. You are the best. And I'll be back with another video for you tomorrow. I don't have anyone. Uh, I don't have an interview yet for this Thursday. Um, since I've gotten the new setup, I've been doing a lot of like trying to Fix. Like it says founder of the day down here. You see me pull up some screens in the background. I've been learning a lot about it. I do. I, I'm building a new, how you say frame for side by side conversations with me and my guest and I, uh, and I'm hoping to, to do at least one or two over the coming week. So hopefully next Thursday, we have another interview, but tomorrow, not yet. Uh, I'll just be doing a regular founder, but it'll be a lot of fun. And then on Friday, Hey, I don't know if you guys came on Friday when we did our quiz, but it was actually a lot of fun. We were on here, despite the fact that I grew, screwed up for half an hour and made people wait, and they graciously did, uh, it ended up being a lot of fun. We talked for like an hour and a half. So um, I'm going to throw the cards on the floor and then invite you to come pick them up with me. So come for Trivia on Friday and make sure you like and subscribe. If you're here this long, you're probably already subscribed, but if not, definitely subscribe and hit like. Uh, thank you so much, guys. I'm out of here, and I will leave you with a front bottom. What? No, uh, round bottom, round bottom. If you don't know what that means, keep coming back. I'll explain it next week. Thanks, guys.